first of all, welcome everybody. This is the uh, Women in Technology uh, panel. Uh, it's a great pleasure to have you here. Uh, I'm Helga Zetzen, I'm the SID president. But um, this particular event is, is probably one of the ones closest to my heart at Display Week, uh, mainly because, you know, a few years ago, uh, Shri did tell me what to do. So I've, I, um, I'm a very firm believer that a uh, diverse boardroom is a better room, that a diverse company is a better company, and therefore that a diverse society, uh, you know, capital S society as in the Society for Information Display, is a better society if we have a broad, diverse representation in it. And so over the last few years on the executive board, we've made a lot of strides to push for uh, all forms of diversity, uh, regional growth, uh, uh, gender diversity, obviously, uh, but also, you know, uh, diversity in the sense of shifting from a hard technology focus towards inclusion of our business and product line management type of colleagues. Uh, and so, uh, uh, two, three years ago, three years ago, uh, she uh, uh, got inspired uh, to create the Women in Tech Forum, and I, you know, immediately lent my enthusiastic support as I do with all things this wonderful guy does. Um, and so here we are. We started uh, this is the third uh, Women in Tech uh, Forum. Uh, it's now been joined by actually uh, quite a lot of uh, diversity-oriented events at Display Week. So uh, all day today, actually, we have the uh, Young Career uh, se sequence of events and, and events that are, you know, that's another sort of underserved demographic that traditionally our society did not embrace as much as we should. Uh, and in fact, right after this, we'll have a networking uh, reception where we'll bring all the different streams together, the early career part, the women in technology, the business-oriented programs, and so forth, so that uh, we can all co-mingle in that. Uh, so, uh, this is an important event. I thank you all for attending. We are looking forward to a great panel. I will not introduce the panel because that will be done in a second by Jenny, our esteemed moderator. Uh, who I do want to introduce, though, are our sponsors. Uh, events like this uh, benefit greatly from sponsorship, uh, not just for you know what you see here and some support and so forth for the speakers, but mostly actually so we get food and booze right after at the networking reception. <laughs> so <laughs> that's the that's really the, the key component. We just like we just have to wait through it. I'm just my apologies, ladies. <laughs> um, so uh, uh, our first sponsor is uh, Clear Inc. Uh, where do, there you go. Uh, Feng Wei was just gonna have a quick few words. All yours. Which one, Bob? <laughs> Such an honor. Thank you. Um, I'd like to start with a picture. Um, you can see on, on your, this is left. <laughs> it's is Rosie the Riveter. And it was initially posted, posted at uh, Westinghouse factories in the early 1940s. It was produced as a nationwide effort to encourage more women to join the workforce while American men were enlisting for the wall. It is deemed as the most iconic image for um, working women. And during World War II, it is estimated about 60 million women joined the workforce. Some never worked before. They become steel workers, streetcar drivers, construction crew, as well as office workers. We have made great progress today. Um, women dominate the professional workforce. 56%. When it comes to technology, however, the numbers can be quite different. IT jobs, 25% held by women. And engineers in Silicon Valley startups, 12% are held by women. And startup owned by 5% owned by women. Why is the difference? Um, you can look at a comic that explains some of the bias uh, that's common and still in the society. So if you're a man, you can't do math, then it's just you. If you're a woman, you can't do math, then women cannot do math. The question is, what can we do? I'd like to share a story first. I know a young girl who became very interest, interested in science in grade school. She read extensively from science fiction to real science, and her dream was to become an astronaut. And she was a good student. She was asked to make a speech at a school gathering about my dream. And she definitely wrote a speech, and her speech is about, I want to become an astronaut. Um, in the end, 
she was asked to change the speech and her dream to, I want to become a teacher when I grow up. <laughs> Why? Because women don't become astronauts. I have to admit, I was that girl. I still read about science. I still gaze upon the star and wonder what's out there. But I conformed, I had conceded. My first job was indeed in teaching. <laughs> My parents were happy. I landed a safe career uh, to be taken care of for the rest of my life, but I was not. So uh, when I realized I would never be happy living someone else's life and expectations, I made a choice. I started all over in business again. It took a lot of courage for me to start from scratch. And I did it because I made a choice to become true to myself, to know what I really want, and have the courage to pursue it. So um, as of today, um, employers and the society, including Clear Inc., we still have to do a lot about encouraging women and support women's technology uh, in career. But I joined Clear Inc. because I believe in the technology. I see a bright future, and I want to have the chance to make a difference. And also, I, the most important reason is I want to make sure I'm true to myself. That's why I made a choice that matters to me, and I choose to have no regrets. So we have made this far. We are going to change the technology world again. We can do it. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much. I'm pleased to report that up in Canada, um, our head of state and governor general uh, and good friend Julie Payette is an astronaut or was an astronaut becoming forming head of state of at least a small country. Uh, so it, it, can do, it can be done, all aspects of it. Um, the other sponsorship returning yet again, and thank you so much in advance for that, is uh, Microsoft. Lin Yu Rao, uh, I think you were going to say a few words. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, my name is Lin Hui Rao. I'm from the Microsoft the Surface uh, Display Development Group. Microsoft is super excited about the sponsoring this event. And for me personally, it's a, such a great privilege to stand here again to share and cheer for women in tech. So I used to work in a startup company. I was the only woman engineer in the entire team. It was a great team and everybody respected me. At that time, I was responsible for all the display activities, you know, in a smaller company. The majority of the customer or the suppliers that I have worked with are male engineers. I often received emails calling me Mr. Rao, or sometimes when we met for the first time in person, they would say, ah, sorry. I did not know that you're a woman, you're a lady. I would just smile and reply back, yes, and I am your counterpart. So I view this as a reflection of the culture in the society. And the assumption is that the STEM world is for men. And this is exactly the barrier women are facing when pursuing STEM-related career or even leadership positions. So in today, I'm glad that I'm standing here because we all want to cheer and share this women in technology stories. So in this tech world today, women are vastly underrepresented. And this disparity is not an indication that women cannot do math, cannot do STEM, or cannot lead. On the opposite, there are plenty of successful women in tech like our speakers here today, like all who you are sitting here today. There is a Chinese saying, women hold up half of the sky. It's not just about population. Women can bring a diversified voice and a different perspective. Women know women better. So this is already half of the world's business. I mean, real business. So again, in this uh, world recently, there have been a lot of focus to help in this pers perspective and brings a lot of 
move, uh, attention to the movement, like uh, Me Too movement, like Time's Up movement. Despite this focus, we still hear a lot of stories like harassment or discrimination for women or female engineer, female employees. I think the problem is that the cultural is even more deep-rooted than we thought. So in this case, we really need the courage and support amongst us, as well as our men allies to do this together to shift this mindset. I know this is a long way to go, but we should all sign up for this. I feel grateful that the companies that I have worked for are all supporting women, supporting diversity and inclusion. I deeply believe that we need a very open society to bring this diversity to life, to embrace the unique strengths of different gender. And while we are urging for this open society, self-belief and self-confidence are the keys to success. So go fearless, women in tech. Thank you. It's actually been 11 years at Display Week, so or with SID. But I don't know if it's a compliment that it seems like more, or I'm not sure. But anyway, um, yes, I am Jenny Donnellan, and I am the director of uh, marketing and publications for Palisades Convention Management. And I'm also a technology journalist of with many years' experience. I started out. At Ziff Davis, I worked for PC Magazine. I also worked for Byte Magazine, if anyone remembers that publication. Mm -hmm. And uh, Computer Graphics World, which is a magazine that enjoys a relationship with the conference and organization SIGGRAPH in sort of a way uh, that is similar to how Information Display works with SID and Display Week. So, and then I was editor, um, an editor with, dis with Information Display for about 10 years. So. That brings us to today. Um, I remember when I started coming to Display Week, there were two things that really struck me because I've been to a lot of trade shows, SIGGRAPH and CES and Comdex, which is now gone. And I noticed that Display Week was a very calm and quiet and peaceful show compared to those other shows. And I also noticed that if I went to the bathroom, I had my choice of 10 enormous bathrooms <laughs> And there was never another woman in there, which, you know, that's great in a way. It's great when you need to use the bathroom, but it, you know, what it indicates about the population as a whole is probably not so positive. So I think that events like this are, are fantastic, and I'm really delighted to be part of, to be part of it because uh, I've seen all two of them leading up to this. And um, I did want to give a shout out to Tara Akavan, who who was, has been the moderator, was the moderator last year. And um, if Shri is the brain of women in tech, then uh, Tara Akavan is maybe its heart and soul. And, and she just did a fantastic job assembling panelists. And I, I remember leaving the, the panel last year and feeling very like revved up and excited. So she had a baby girl about three weeks ago. Mm -hmm. So obviously cannot be here, but she is with us in spirit. So. Um, 
that's pretty much it for that, and I'm going to introduce our great panelists, and I thank them for being here. You can come on up. I will start out with Lee Epting. She is an advisor, speaker, and technology consultant. Next is Samantha Phoenix. I'm sure a lot of you know Samantha very well, also as Sam. And she is vice president of R&D with Planar, a Layard company. Did I get that right? Yeah, Nailed it. I've been practicing that. I've been saying it wrong all my life. Um, and Consuelo Valverde, who is founder and managing partner of SV Latham Capital. So please give them a hand. <laughs> Thank you. Well, I have introduced myself, um, so I would love to hear from the three of you. And maybe Lee will start, we'll go alphabetically this way. If you could give us a little bit of, about your background and what you're working on these days. Great. Um, thank you for having me here today. Um, so my career started in the Valley. Um, I actually most notably worked for, I worked for a lot of different uh, businesses in the Valley, but the most notable ones was Palm Computing and then going on to be one of the founding team members of Handspring. And we worked on uh, handheld digital devices that ultimately then came with the first integrated smartphone for the industry, um, arguably. There were others that did do some things like Symbian and others, but, um, and Scion, but um, nonetheless uh, had a great, great, great time with those startups, but ultimately decided that I wanted to move on to bigger ground. Um, so I took a position with Nokia um, in Finland and was the first executive, I believe, if not first woman executive in 150 years of that company to move to Finland um, and work as an executive in the company. I was pretty daunting. Uh, I moved from Woodside, California, and a beautiful home overlooking an estuary into the dead of Finnish winter at minus 20. <laughs> uh, I had a baby that was one years old, and uh, my husband and a dog, not in that order. We all went together. And um, I had a real big um, curve to go up uh, coming out of Silicon Valley. So it was brave, um, and I learned a lot. Um, about living in Finnish culture and such, and, uh, and how to be successful in a company like Nokia. Um, and after that, then I, I moved uh, to another large telecoms provider called Vodafone. Um, and uh, I was based out of London for that role. Um, and I decided that that was a great learning ground, and I had huge amount of resources to really impact things at a global level, like trying to close the gender gap divide of women ownership of mobile phones, 300 million women without mobile phones in emerging markets. Mm -hmm. Why? Cultural, religious, and because of their sex. So how do you close that gap? So I got to work with people like Tony Blair's wife, Sheree Blair, and Hillary Clinton and others on doing that. So that was a great learning ground for me, but I didn't want to be at a telco um, because it's all about selling air, and I needed something more physical. So I went to Samsung, and people said, oh, you're going to go to Samsung, Korean company. Um, how are you going to do that? Uh, how's that going to work for you? Um, and, I, and I thought, well, it's a great opportunity, again, to learn about another culture and to be, once again, I believe, the only woman executive in Europe uh, amongst my uh, 90 other CEO president level that were there that were all men, and I was the only woman. So not only the bathroom was always empty for me, <laughs> but when we would go to Korea and have food and everyone had to lose their shoes before we went in to sit down and eat, there was about 180 pairs of shoes and my Chanel shoes sitting in the middle. <laughs> <laughs> and I remember taking a picture of that once and saying, there's something wrong with that. Um, so nonetheless, though, I had a wonderful time there. And um, so I decided then to leave my corporate career um, and come back to the U.S. a few years ago. Uh, I'm a citizen of the U.K., I'm a citizen of the U.S., and I also am due to be an Italian citizen as well because my husband's from Italy. But um, I, um, I came back to the U.S. so our son could go to school and get ready for his college education, which is now coming this next year. So I took a break from my large corporate roles, um, and I've been doing some tech consulting and advisory work and, um, and really enjoying that, just sort of being able to have freedom to kind of do what I wanted to do and get interested and con you know, contribute to areas of businesses that I might not have been able to do under my former, more, let's say, strict corporate career uh, roles. And that's me in a nutshell. Thank you. Thank you. It's very impressive. Yeah. 
Sam, what about you? Gosh, I don't know how I can follow that. I know, I know. <laughs> True, go. I'm sure you can. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so let's see. So um, I'm an immigrant. I uh, grew up in Northern Ireland in Belfast in the 70s, which was super exciting, um, though I didn't know it at the time. Um, and I have a computer science degree, and after college, uh, I moved to the States. Uh, I moved to Portland, Oregon, Silicon Forest. I heard there was a lot of you know, tech jobs there, so I thought I'd give it a go. Um, and I worked for a small company um, that made uh, air traffic control and medical devices, kind of a strange mix. Um, and we were acquired by Barco, mm -hmm. a Belgian company. Um, a couple of years after that, and um, <clears throat> I spent a long time there. I was probably there, I think, uh, 13 years. Um, again, started as a as a software engineer. Um, my boss, who was actually a woman um, and a good friend, uh, went on maternity leave, and they asked me to cover for her while she was gone, and she um, she stayed away for eight years. <laughs> so <laughs> my management happened completely by accident, and we're still friends, even though she abandoned me. Um, so I got into management, I ended up running the software team and then the all of engineering team and then um, I did my MBA and I actually became the general manager for the division in, in Oregon. Um, and at that time I was the most senior, like the only senior leader female in tech in, in Barco. It's, it's quite a male company. Um, West Flanders is, is, is quite a male dominated uh, part of the world. Um, and after that, I went to um, Dell and then at Intel and, and wanted to exercise uh, some of the learning that I had through my MBA program um, to see the other side of business. So I worked in vertical strategy um, and business development alliances um, until uh, Jerry Perkale, who was the CEO of Planar, came calling and wanted me to come run his R&D organization. Um, and Planar is a, it was a spinoff from Tektronix. You know, we've got a lot of alumni here, Shri being one of them. Um, and so I, I came back to the display business, um, back to running uh, research and development, which is where my passion is, um, back to displays, which is where my passion is. Um, I've actually been coming to Sid for, I don't know, 20 something years at this point. Um, and uh, we were acquired three years ago by Liard, which is a Chinese company. Um, the market leader in fine pitch LED, which is a display technology that Sid seems to have passed by. Um, <laughs> got my little digging. Um, and uh, yeah, I think that's, that's about it for me. Okay. okay, well everybody has really different experience and you as a venture capitalist, probably the most different of all. So why don't you tell us about your path? Yes, um, I'm also an immigrant like Sam. I'm originally from Mexico. I moved uh, to San Francisco 14 years ago, but before that, I grew up in Mexico, spent a lot of time in Florida, particularly Miami. My dad was Cuban, so where do Cubans go <laughs> in Miami? Uh, so I, I loved science when I, when I was a young girl. I, I asked a lot of questions. I had a dad, that, uh, a father that encouraged me a lot into mm. science and being independent. So I would spend the summers uh, taking private physics lessons because I wanted to be ahead <laughs> or something like that. And uh, so I remember having a conversation with my dad when I was 11 years old and he was taking me to school and he told me, hey, there's a new area in science called computer science. I just read about it in the newspaper. Uh, since you like math, and physics so much, probably you should get into that. And uh, I was like, okay, well, I'll take <laughs> that into account. So when um, I graduated from high school, I was not even 16 years old, so I had to wait a little bit, and I went to college at University of Miami, because we had family there, and it would be easier for me to adapt. So I, I was gonna major in uh, computer science, but the first day when I uh, was in school, uh, I learned that because computer science was part of the School of Arts and Sciences, I would have to take history, English, whatever, you know, languages. And I was like, I don't like paragraphs, I just like numbers. <laughs> Where do I find numbers? School of Engineering, okay. <laughs> so that's why I'm electrical engineer. I did end up uh, uh, doing a master's in computer science and then a master's in uh, science entrepreneurship in the UK, how to turn science into business. 
then I started a PhD in genomics medicine. I really like biology, so I wish I was born probably 10 years later so I could be doing computational biology or something crazy <laughs> like that. Uh, and uh, so I dropped out from, from that PhD. I didn't finish. It was more as part of a strategy that uh, I got into that, uh, that I thought I needed that that experience, and I have a fellowship, a Kaufman Fellowship in, in uh, venture capital. Mm -hmm. So my career probably started uh, as an entrepreneur moving back to Mexico. I couldn't get a job as an electrical engineer woman, 20 year old. Mm -hmm. I looked at the newspaper, everybody was looking for a guy. You know, like at that mm -hmm. time, you know, they were like, okay, uh, gender, masculine. I'm like, okay, I cannot do that. So. I'll show up to the interviews anyway. I don't know what they were thinking. You know? So I don't know if that's why I never got a job or, or what was the reason. So I created my own job. My dad had always been an entrepreneur. Uh, so I thought I will just start a PC manufacturing company. So that's what I did first. That was before NAFTA. So we, I was importing uh, pieces from, from uh, Taiwan. And we, you know, oh, I used to go to Convex. I went to oh, Convex sure. okay. with my dad, yeah. <laughs> you know, buying pieces. I might have been there, out. who knows? Yeah. So, <laughs> you know, all that stuff. And uh, I did a series of other entrepreneurship uh, endeavors like an IT training center, and then I got involved in the government. So I've also been in politics, head of innovation, science, and technology. I don't like politics, uh, but I like uh, doing things that matter and being involved in uh, things that have impact in the world. Fast forward when I, I, I come to the US and uh, I had always from, well, actually from 2005, I wanted to start a VC fund based originally in Mexico and I would go to the UK as I had been there uh, before for my masters, but I ended up here and uh, 2013, I start the venture fund. And at that time there was probably up to two or three years ago before the Me Too movement, there was less than 4% of uh, partners at VC firms were women. Mm -hmm. So I know from many friends that want to get into the industry, it's really hard. So again, I think I created my own job, you know, basically. And uh, I started, I, I like hard things. Uh, so I started not only a VC fund in Silicon Valley as a you know, Mexican immigrant, uh, but focused in science and technology. Mm -hmm. So investing in science and technology enabled startups with a focus in Latin America. This was before Latin America was hot in the valley. You know, it was when Mexico was, let's go to Cancun. And <laughs> you know, that's it. So people will ask, oh, are there engineers in Mexico? We didn't know, we thought only in India outside the US. You know? So yeah. I got those kind of uh, questions and uh, so that's where I am right now. We have uh, the connection to Display Week probably is, uh, we, one of our investments is in, that I'm very proud of. They're here in this room and it's uh, Ares Materials. Mm -hmm. Two Mexican co-founders born in Mexico did their PhDs um, in, in the US, uh, the uh, University of Texas in Dallas and they're doing uh, optical filters for display applications. Yes. Okay, thank you. Thank you. It, it really strikes me how important it is to have that supportive parent oh, yes. or somebody, that support of somebody early on uh, it makes all the difference, you know, especially that it was your dad. Yes. Yeah, that's great. Um, I'd like to ask each of you, starting with you, Sam, um, <laughs> about some advice that you might uh, have for your younger self, because I know as a woman, uh, you know, in business or in business, uh, you know, there are things I wish I had known when I was younger. Um, I mean, there are things I berate myself for things I did the week before, but um, I think that it's really important to share the lessons that we've learned. So maybe you could tell us the most important piece of advice you'd have for young Sam starting out. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, one of the speakers earlier mentioned about, you know, being true to yourself. Um, I think, you know, it's just a, a fact. Women are different from men. And um, I think we're taught that uh, in order to be successful in business, we have to become something different. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and I don't think that's necessarily true. Um, so I think, you know, being true to yourself, listening to your inner voice, you know, having that, that confidence, you already have a seat at the table. I mean, they've, you know, you've, you've already succeeded. You've already you know, passed the classes or gone mm -hmm. to college or got a job, like you're there for a reason. So take up the space that you've been given 
um, and embrace it and don't and and don't wait to be invited you're already in yeah um, I think that's one thing and then the other thing that really didn't exist when I was um, early in my career is like there's so many opportunities to network with other mm -hmm. women with people in technology mm -hmm. um, there's so many online communities now where you can reach out for support and um, people are really willing to help if you just ask for help mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, you know I came to sit to display week for years I'd, I'd never talked to anyone I just went and went to the symposium talks and took my notes and you know learned all wow you haven't always been this involved no, I didn't, <laughs> I didn't talk to anyone. I would like go into the talks and like take all my notes. And sure, like, my mind sure. was blown at some of the stuff I was learning. Yeah, and then I'd go back to work. No, mm -hmm. I wouldn't have talked to anyone the whole mm -hmm. week. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. So, what got you started? I think um, when I did this vertical s strategy for Dell, um, I'm not a great public speaker, so I'm sorry. <laughs> um, but I had to do that a lot. Um, for that oh, job, you know, I okay. was doing business development partnerships, alliances, and so I was getting on a stage. I was, um, I was going to, oh my God, networking events where I had to talk to people, yeah, um, which was just nerve wracking for me. But I, it it got me to the point where it's like, oh, well, they're actually just people like mm -hmm. every other people. It's you know, sure. So it's not that scary. So, and That's good. once I started doing that for my, I had to for my job. Um, then I started to do it more and in places that I enjoy and people that I enjoy talking to, which, you know, this feels like coming home. I love Display Week. It's yeah, great, me it's too. Great event. Me too. Yeah. Uh, what about you, Lee? Do you have a piece of advice for people yeah, starting um, out? I, if I think back to my younger self, um, I tend to think that when I, when I had opportunities or I came to a new place of work, I, I I had too much fear as my baggage when I would walk in because the fear of the unknown. I think everyone has that when they go into a new job. You know, yeah. it's like drinking from a fire hose, they say, right? There's so much to consume. But I think women more than men tend to put more pressure on themselves to want to know everything and be perfect before we act. And um, there's maybe higher expectations as well on us. So if I were to give my younger self some advice, I would say try not to put so much pressure on yourself come in with a no fear attitude and just drink up as much as you can drink up in terms of information. The first place I always went in my jobs, and I wasn't an engineer, I'm, they say I'm technical enough to be dangerous. I don't have an engineering degree, but I've worked and led large engineering organizations in very large companies. I've built software, I've designed software, I've embedded software. You know, I, I'm kind of scary because I don't actually know the engineering, but I know the right questions to ask. So the first place I go when I go to a, a new company is I go to the engineers. And I sit with the engineers and I ask them a bunch of probably what they think are really dumb questions. But for me, it's helping me piece together a puzzle about why we're building what we're building, what are we going after, what's, what matters. Um, but that networking piece internally is very important. So you need to build the picture of the puzzle, no matter what the size of the company is, educate yourself and don't have fear. Then ask for the opportunity. Do not hold back and think, I shouldn't ask because somebody else beat me to it that asked for that. Usually it's a male colleague because that's the fact in technology that you're outnumbered. Um, so I would say don't be fearful. Go ask and get that support internally and go after new things. That's, that's what helped me succeed in my career. Mm -hmm. I raised my hand and I said, I would like to do this. You know, This is something I'm interested in. I think I could be good at this. And um, as, as a result, I was able to take on very new things for the businesses I worked in and literally build entire business units within these large multinationals to go do new things. Yeah. No, I, I'm struck by your, what you said about wanting to be perfect before you act, mm -hmm. because I think especially uh, a lot of women, I know it includes me, you want your gold star and you want to do well. And, and it's hard, sometimes it's better to focus on the job at hand and not on whether you're going to mess up or something. I guess I just injected my little, little lesson here out of turn, but that's, yeah. it's really important. If you're, if you're stuck with like, doing everything perfectly, you won't do anything. I, I see this as well if you've ever, you know, go around kids or whatever, or if you've ever taught you know, or engaged with young children and you, you, know, you, you, say, you see a kid come out of a, a test and you say, how'd you do? And you see the, uh, the girl come out and go, I just got a text from my, my son's ex-girlfriend. You know, she's finishing up high school and going off to college, and she had a big AP exam. And she said, I think I failed my AP exam. You know, I failed it. And I said, 
<laughs> okay. And I was thinking that if I were to get that same message from my son, he would say, I nailed it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but maybe he didn't nail it, but he came out saying he nailed it. And yeah. actually, in the end, it doesn't matter. So I wrote her back. I said, it doesn't matter. You've been accepted to the university you want to go to. Pass or fail. Keep moving. You know, that's my, that's my um, message to her. Keep moving. Because she's super smart and talented. Um, yeah. It doesn't matter if she failed her AP exam. But her first point of, of thought was, yeah, I failed it. I failed it, yeah. And, no, and carrying that good. baggage. you got to dump that baggage. Very good, very good. What about you, Consuela? What advice yeah, would you have? Yeah, I think I, I will second that. Uh, I, I think in different episodes of my life, I have felt that I wasn't prepared for those roles. So mm -hmm. I needed more, you know, and more. And, and a lot of the times it was like, I need another degree or, you know, I wanted to launch an innovation center in Mexico. So that's kind of what triggered the uh, Masters in Science Entrepreneurship in the UK. Mm -hmm. And then I wanted the Genomics Medicine Institute to be located in my hometown and uh, the whole networking with that community. So I got involved and I ended up in that PhD program. And uh, launching the fund, I thought, well, I'm not capable for that. I, I need a program. So there are no, at the, I mean, at least five, six years ago, there wasn't a master's in venture capital or yeah. something, you know, in that set. There are programs in different universities and this fellowship, the Kaufman Fellowship. So I applied and I ended up uh, getting that. But you know, you feel like, I, I felt several times in my life where I'm not prepared for mm -hmm. that. You know, I need this extra thing or you know, it's even to be a board member or, or, or anything. So I, I think um, I will just say that it's better just to just try it and just do it. Like one important thing is to ask and another one, if someone's not giving you that, of course you make it happen. Mm -hmm. Uh, but also don't feel like you need all these credentials and all this experience. I mean, I also see it in entrepreneurs. They're very different, you know, uh, men and women. Guys tend to feel like, no, I went great. You know, yeah, after a meeting, yeah. a woman is like, well, I think I should have said this other thing, <laughs> and I think I, I didn't do this right. And you, mm -hmm. you can see that, that we have. There's something, I don't know if there's something also, the way our brain works and we're yeah. tend to be overthinking. Yeah, uh, yeah. I, I, I uh, went for a ski lesson fairly recently, and they, they asked me, you know, what level are you? And I'm like, ah, close to expert. And, and the woman that I went out with, the instructor, said after a while, she said, you're really interesting because most women underrate their ability at skiing, but you have overrated your ability <laughs> at skiing. But I guess it was a compliment in a way, but, but you're right. We tend to devalue what it is that we've accomplished. Thank you. Um, I wanted to ask Lee um, about your experience with other countries and cultures because you've mm -hmm. really been involved in some, some, a variety of cultures. And, and what, what, as a woman especially, um, do you have some stories about how you got through those experiences? Um, sure. Um, well, um, everyone that goes to Finland, you need to get naked in sauna. So you need to get over that. <laughs> And um, you know, if you want to bond with your Finnish colleagues, you need to get naked in sauna. I'm not kidding, actually. And I remember when I first moved there, um, I kept getting these sort of guidance because you know, uh, when you show up normally, they'll have some people shouting you a bit to make sure that you're successful in the integration of hitting the minus 20 and 20 feet of snow and how you deal with it all. And um, they kept saying, "When are you going to go up to?" Salo and and get go to the well go to sauna, and I kept saying, well, I'll get there, but like I've got all this business I need to do, and they're like, you need to go sauna with this team up there because you've got 150 people setting up there that now work for you, and they need to be in the sauna with you, and I was wow. like, oh, all of us together, like naked, <laughs> and uh, they're like, yes, don't worry about it. We finish are very comfortable with that. We all have a family sauna. You know, I had a sauna in my house. Um, uh, you know, in, in Finland, and that's your life, that's your, you know, kind of your weekend enjoyment, because you really can't go outside, it's too cold, so you sauna with the family inside. And, um, and so that would be a, a big learning, just as a, a sort of a, more of a message, which is you need to embrace where you're going and understand the importance of certain things and why you do them. And um, uh, I have a great, just little story I'll tell you real quick, because obviously there's lots of learnings even from 
from Korea as well. Korea, it's all about you better have a good toast and you better know how to pour and drink your alcohol oh, yeah. um, and, and do that right because there's a lot of face in that. And so having a great toast and knowing the, the protocol for, for pouring alcohol for your more senior colleagues and what to do, it's quite important. Mm -hmm. um, but um, in, in the uh, Nokia example, to give you an example, I had all those colleagues up in, in the very north of Finland, and I had people all around the globe working for me, but these in particular were very important, and they kept urging me to get on this train and go up to this uh, place called Turku. And I went there, and I showed up, and there was my picture was on a wall in a building. <laughs> And it had some writing in Finnish. And of course, I, I don't speak Finnish. My kid ended up learning Finnish because he grew up there as a one-year-old. So he spoke Finnish, but we never learned that. And I thought, I wonder what that says. So um, they said, you need to meet your team downstairs. So I go running down. I go downstairs for the meeting, and there's about 150 people in the room. And in typical Finnish uh, nature, all of them are sitting in the back of the room. And the whole front <laughs> of the room is empty chairs. And I'm thinking, oh my goodness. So I walked in, I introduced myself. I said, well, you know, we've got the whole day together to talk about strategy and, you know, get going on all these wonderful things. And they're just blank stare looking at me. And I thought, wow. So I said, why don't you all come up, you know, because it's easier for me and I don't have to really project now. And we'll have a nice intimate conversation. Move up, move up. No one moved. <laughs> so I thought, well, I'll launch into my presentation and hopefully they'll come around. First 20 minutes in, nothing was moving. So I literally thought, oh, I've got to change gears here. So I said, could you excuse me for a minute? And I ran out of the room, and I went and got the lady at the front desk. And I said, can you give me a lots of pencils and paper? And I ripped it up into pieces, and I had a, like a box thing. And I walked in, and I just started handing out these shreds of paper and, and pencils. And I said, what I'd like each of you to do is ask any question you'd like to ask of me, personal or professional crumble it up and throw it in this box and please don't put your name on it. And I'll give you some time to do that. And I left the room. And about 20 minutes later, I came back. I had about 100 pieces of paper crumbled up in the box. So I went to the front and I picked one out and it says, do you sauna? <laughs> Hint number one, are you married? Um, do you have children? Am I going to get fired? Um, you know, these kinds of questions. And I realized that fundamentally, for, to be successful for the next five years of my career, it was really about understanding what was really at the core of what their concerns were to end up being great team members and go off and do great things with their career. And a number of them did, and they live in Silicon Valley today because I put them here um, as part of their career growth. And you know, it was a wonderful and great learning experience for me, and, and it, it really highlights the importance of not trying to overcomplicate things when you go into new cultures. Learn the culture, but also be true to yourself and be the person who you are. And for me, it was about wanting to know the people that worked for me. Wow. Um, thank you. And Consuelo, you have, been, um, you have been around the world as well in your job as a venture capitalist. And I know that it hasn't been easy, as you said. There was, you finally ran out of programs to sign up for, and you had to create your own. And um, can you tell me, I think you said something like, um, yeah, yeah, you can always find reasons why something is hard. And, and so you've gone around the world and, and in this role, which, what, how have you found it? What have been some of the challenges for you? Yeah, probably, I, I think uh, Sam in one of our prep uh, calls mentioned something like me, like uh, whenever I, I have found a difficulty you know, now, or you know, when I was first raising uh, our first fund or, or in previous experiences or now raising fund two, I don't think the first thing, you know, when you have a hard day and you're like having all this anxiety, like, oh, what's gonna happen? Am I gonna make it? Do I need this thing or whatever? I don't go like, oh, it's because I'm a woman. <laughs> like, it, that's not the thought, kind of like, oh, could I be doing, you know, can I do this other thing, or should I reach out to this person, or what if I have the wrong strategy? Am I spending my time in the right uh, thing, doing mm -hmm. the right things? Am I just too busy you know, with the things that really are not taking me to that uh, achieve that goal? So I, I think that uh, we can always find reasons why something is hard. You mm -hmm. know, like I could say, well, you know, raising a fund, it's hard as a woman. 
I mean, it's hard for anyone. You know, Ninety percent of, of people that start fundraising a fund, regardless of men, women, uh, here in the U.S., don't ever end up raising their first fund. Mm -hmm. yeah. So that leaves ten percent. You know, and it's uh, of course, if you're a woman, I'm not going to say it's harder. If you're minority, you know, Latina, of course, harder. Yes, but also I find kind of like I also have an advantage because many times I'm the only woman. They remember you. So they will remember me. At least I have an advantage automatically. Not that that will make everything, oh, because I'm a woman now, you know, everything's going to happen. Of course not. But it's like whenever you find uh, a difficulty, you can kind of justify that's why it's not happening and that's why it's hard. But, or you can look from the other side and mm -hmm. see how you can use that in your advantage. You know? Because things are hard for men, Yes. Well, as well, and uh, of course, certain things are harder also for men <laughs> than for us. So there's always, so I, I just don't like to focus like, oh, because I'm a woman, this is like that. I mean, I'm sure that many times I'm not aware that many things that happen also mm -hmm. are because, you know, related that, uh, to my gender. But like I always tend to say, like, I am a human being. I happen to be a woman. You know, I'm an engineer. I'm, Many other things as well, you know. Now in venture capital, but yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, that's that's very wise, um, Sam. So you had we've talked a little bit about conversations such as this, yeah. And and that while while useful and certainly Display Week needs more diversity, more women. Um, I wanted to interject that about I I looked I had some help with data for the last. Mm -hmm. Four years at Display Week, and it looks like nine to ten percent women make up make up Display Week attendance. And they're all here, by the way. And they're all here. Yay! And uh, and and then, but leadership. If you were to look at leadership numbers out of that, I'm sure it would be way way lower. Anyway, mm -hmm. um, and and Sam, you had said that while well, discussions like these are great, they're an echo chamber. If it's all women, and and maybe if it's all people who are open to this sort of thing, I see plenty of men out there now. Yeah, so that's that's sure. awesome. Yeah, awesome. But um, what have you found? Like, how do you how do you bridge that gap? Like, have you had successes with getting people to look at things in new ways? Yeah, I'm, I I think um, so. I, you know, I'm involved with some other industry associations. Like, I'm on the board for Avixo, which is a, a Navy association that puts on Infocom, and and we'll have these women's councils and. Um, you know, I'm involved in TAO, which is the Technology Association for Oregon, and we'll have these women's breakfasts. And what I found is, it's like an echo, all, who shows up? All the women, and what do we do? We talk about the fact there's no women in tech, and why? <laughs> well, we all know why, because we're all women in tech. And so it doesn't really help move the ball forward. Like, it really doesn't help change the situation. And yet, when I have conversations with my coworkers, who mostly are men, about it, they're often fathers, husbands, you know, sons, people, there are people who, um, who have women in their lives that they want to see be successful, and you know, some of them want to get into tech, and they're very open as individuals into supporting that notion and having those conversations. But they don't come to these kinds of events because they think they're for women. Yeah. And so I think um, there's value, and I, we've experimented a little bit with this. Mm -hmm. We have these women councils with, like I said, for Avixa, but we explicitly state, like, these are AV events that are put on by the Women's Council, but they're not for women, they're for AV people. And, yeah. and try to encourage them to, the men to come and then have these conversations, because you know, what you find is like, there's this, un, we all have unconscious bias. Even, yes. even us women Absolutely. have unconscious bias. Um, and there's an online test you can take. If you don't think that you have unconscious bias, you do. Um, and so having those conversations about like, things that they don't even realize that they do, that, that block women, and things that women do that block themselves. Yes, have for sure. Like, I will often, just because I'm mostly a nice person, I will, like, offer to get someone a, a water or a coffee if they show up at the office. Um, so I've been trying to coach my guys to be, like, be the, you do that. Like, yes. it's, like, yeah. why am I always getting the coffee? Um, and also for women, this, this confidence gap. So, like, when I mentor and coach, um, if there's a job opportunity, women will not put themselves forward. If, it's, if it has, like, a list of 10 things of criteria, they'll say, oh, well, I only have nine, so I'm not going to apply. 
And a guy will have one of them and they're like, I'm gonna nail it, I'm going for it. <laughs> and, and that's, it's called the confidence gap. It's well documented, yes, yeah. it's very well known. So like, but having the conversations as a, as a cross-functional group, um, as a diverse group, um, just helps with understanding. And then, mm -hmm. and then giving people these perspectives so we can fight the unconscious bias that, that we all have. And apparently that we are also programming into all these AI devices. I don't know if you guys know about this, but they've stopped using AI to screen resumes because the people who wrote them were men. And so uh, they screen out women's resumes. So wow, I did even not AI know that. has unconscious bias. I did not know that. Mm. So, it's a tough world out there. <laughs> it is. Um, wow, we, we don't, do not have many minutes left, and uh, we might have time for a question or two, but before that, I really would love it if each of you could give us uh, an example of a book or a podcast or something that you've read, because I, I love to have something to come away with that, to, to that for further reading. So maybe just go down the row, Lee. I'm going to go back uh, a bit and just uh, give you one book that I use. I usually buy about, I don't know, 20 or 30 of them when I go into new roles and keep them in my drawer. It was a book back in the 1990s uh, by a doctor by the name of Spencer Johnson, and it's called Who Moved My Cheese? <laughs> oh, yeah. That's and uh, some of you are shaking your head, and some of you may not know about it. But, <laughs> um, you know, leadership is about managing change well. And if you want to be a leader, you need to know how to manage change, which means you need to understand the psyche behind people who are facing change. And at least in the businesses that I've operated in in the last 20 plus years of my career, there has been a ton of change. And some people do well with it and some people don't, but actually there's an opportunity to help people who don't do well with it by understanding mm -hmm. better w who they are. Are they one of the mice or are they one of the little people in this book? So if you haven't read it, you should get it. And if you're leading or managing, you should probably keep some copies of it. And when you reach people, you had you know, people in your team that are challenged with change, give them a copy because it'll help them be more self-realized around how they're behaving and what might be some of the drivers on that. And that's Who Moved My Cheese Who by? Who Moved My Cheese by Spencer Johnson. Thank you. Sam? Um, well, since this is a technology event, and us tech people, we're not known for our emotional intelligence. <laughs> Turns out EQ is just as important in business as IQ, um, and so I always recommend, even though my guys are like, I don't want to talk about my feelings, um, <laughs> Daniel Goleman, um, reading about emotional intelligence, primal leadership is, is one of the books, but there's a whole slew of them. There's even courses that you can take, but I, I think you know, as engineers, we do tend to focus on the data and the facts and, and, and not on you know, emotions and feelings. And, in the end, we are all people. B business is all about you do business with people that you know, like, and trust. And how do you get to know, like, and trust people? It's by building relationships. So I think the value of EQ, especially um, in STEM, because it, it's so ignored when we go through that, that education path, we, we tend to not. Especially for STEM. We not take those liberal arts classes, yeah. right? <laughs> um, it's good to round that out. So I, yeah, I strongly recommend Daniel Goleman. Okay, thank yeah. you. And Consuelo? So for me, probably um, on the tech side, uh, the hard thing about hard things from Ben Horowitz. And oh, yeah, yeah. on the other side, probably um, Principles by Ray Dalio. Uh, principles by Ray. Principles by Ray Dalio. So oh, yeah. he's a very su successful hedge fund manager, one mm -hmm. of the top two, I think, <laughs> or something like that. But it's not about the hedging. It's more about the principles. I also read it uh, when it just came out, I think, um, almost like two years ago. Mm -hmm. And it really made a big impact on uh, how I look at relationships in building teams within the fund and in the startups that we invest. Mm -hmm. So he has some great insights on how important principles are. Mm -hmm. And wouldn't it be great to know what were uh, Leonardo da Vinci's and Steve Jobs' principles on how yeah. they made decisions in life. Wow. So kind yeah. of be, having that clarity in life, what your principles are, mm -hmm. being very transparent and open about them with your team and, and outside and anyone interacting with your company. Mm -hmm. So I think I found it to be a great, great book. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Thank you. I have not read, well, I've read Who Moved My Cheese, but not for a long time. Mm -hmm. So I will, re I will revisit classic. it. Thank yeah. you. Oh, boy, we're pretty tight. Maybe if we have time for maybe one question. Does anybody have a question of the panel? 
that's the best thing about tech events. Everybody's too Nobody shy. Nobody has. Well, you know what? We do. Ha oh, 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 we do have a question. Yes. Thank you. Can you say <laughs> who you are? Uh, hi, my name is Lee Tu, okay. and actually, I really uh, I'm really impressed by all the things you talk when you were like younger, because I'm facing all of the questions. In the first year when I was in I said, yeah, I didn't talk with anyone. I just run a note and go home. And this year, I forced myself to talk and then mm -hmm. make uh, asking questions. And also, because I'm in a new um, project, and I always feel, oh, there's so many hard problems. A lot of things I don't know. It's a lot of baggage. And I always feel like I don't have enough degree. That's why I got two masters. And so, <laughs> so uh, actually, I have the questions I have. Uh, there's a lot of them. I believe people have a lot, too. And my question is, how you uh, make sure like when you're in a new field and then you feel like you're um, learning something not about what you're doing but also about what's surrounding and then like in a strategic way because I we only have this much um, we only have this much time but if we want to probably find a new direction for our future mm -hmm. or like trying to know uh, what will move us forward and then to the next level and probably we're not only just doing what we're doing and what's your master to learn the new things? Thank you. Who wants to take? Does anyone want to go? Oh, I have a one one uh, thing I would recommend. Um, so I'm a big believer in um, you within your business going and setting up some informational interviews with people in other parts of the business that you're interested in. And I think what we don't do a good enough job about in our day to day is actually communicating with other parts of the business because we tend to get very siloed. Um, on what you're doing. So if you want to learn something about strategy or you want to learn something about marketing or you want because you're in engineering, then you need to go to the director of that group or someone there that you think is you know reputable and say, I'd like to sit down and have a 30 minute informational discussion with you about what you're doing. Um, and ask a bunch of questions. And you'll find that people love to talk about what they're doing. <laughs> and, um, and then at the same time, as a thank you, you bring a small presentation around what you're doing so that you in turn can also share. And that's how you build successful businesses by creating those linkages between different areas. And I've, I've used that as a model with a number of uh, organizations I've worked in and it's always been just wonderful and, and hugely successful. So that's what I would suggest. That's really good advice. Thank you. We have another question. Uh, this is um, less of a question, but more about the sharing. So thank you very much for the wonderful sharing. Um, I really enjoy this. And then especially to Sam, you just mentioned that for a lot of like women activities, it's just the women attending it. And I'm very happy to see that today. It's not just women here. There are a lot of... Uh, male, like men here, and uh, I want to thank my team for, like our team, a lot of uh, my manager, like all of them are here. Um, and also I think it's, it's very important uh, to have this momentum and message like um, when organizing this women related event, it's really important. I think it would be really, really helpful to have men involved. I think with this together, that will be like even more meaningful event because you know, different genders, they have different perspectives. And when we talk about this, this is really when new idea happens. So thank you very much for talking about that. I appreciate okay. it. Thank you. Thank you. OK, well, thank you all very, very much. And thanks to our panelists. We so appreciate the time. And I've learned a lot. Um, I want everyone to know that there is a reception next door, just right next door. And that will include the people from uh, the CEO forum that took that took place. Could I just ask who was at the CEO forum as well? It was here before. Maybe a third, something like that. Okay, just curious, just interested in those kinds of things. Um, but in any case, members, um, people who were at the CEO forum and and people who are here are welcome to go next door and you can talk with the panelists and ask them more questions. So thank you very very much. And um, thank you. <laughs>